what every Adventist scientist should know, the privileged planet. We've been doing a series on what every Adventist scientist should know. Our first talk was on the philosophy of science. We've been going through, is there a God? Did the origin of the universe last week? Privileged planet today, the origin of life next week, and so forth. Uh, we've already talked about how old is life on Earth. Uh, we have one left in that, and that's paleocurrence. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about challenges to young life creationism. Um, Leonard Brand is going to assist us on that, and I'm very thankful. And he's also going to assist us on Ellen White's health messages in general. These are issues that I think have good conservative Adventist answers and that are not well known. Uh, the, the conservative Adventist answers are not well known and that need to be better known by the general Adventist population or for that matter the general Christian population. But today we're going to be talking about the privileged planet. Um, it is based on a book by Guillermo Gonzalez and uh, uh, Jay Richards. The book is um, The Privileged Planet, and it was published in 2004. And um, the content is interesting enough. They apparently made a movie, well, they did make a movie about it as well, which is interesting in and of itself. But the book, not surprisingly, is richer in detail. And so I'm going to base this talk off of the book. Uh, I'm going to reorganize it slightly from the way he did. I'm going to start out with the Copernican principle and discuss it. And then I'm going to talk about the universe that is built for life, which is not surprising because if it weren't, we wouldn't be here. But more important, the universe is also built for discovery. Sometimes there's an overlap between those two, and sometimes there's not. And where there is not overlap, the fact that we're here doesn't really help us to understand why the universe should be built so well for discovery. And finally, I'm going to point out that those two concepts, the universe is built for life and the universe is built for discovery, are opposed by believers in naturalism, vigorously, vociferously, to the point where they're willing to destroy careers over it. And then I'll make my comments, and then we'll throw it open for your comments and questions. The Copernican principle was named after Copernicus, who, according to the prevailing narrative, dethroned the Earth from the center of the universe. He dethroned the Earth from the center of the solar system to start with. And then, as we learned more, we found out that the Sun wasn't the center of the galaxy. And as we kept on going, we discovered that our galaxy is just one of many, many different kinds. And kind of the net that was was deduced from this are, was that we are an average planet traveling around an average star in an average galaxy. There's nothing particularly special about us. And a kind of a close corollary of that is that the universe should pretty much look the same from any vantage point. That's the Copernican principle. Now, first of all, uh, we can rename it the pr principle of mediocrity, and perhaps we should right away, because in fact, it's not from Copernicus. Um, there are several ways of, of showing this, but perhaps one of the most interesting ones is to quote Galileo, who of course is in the center of the early controversy. And um, this is... Uh, 
quote that I haven't been able to verify, but uh, seems to be a reasonable one because you can find other ones like it. Uh, many arguments will be provided to demonstrate a very strong reflection of the sun's light from the earth. That's earth shine on the moon. This for the benefit of those who assert, principally on the grounds that it has neither moon, motion, nor light, that the earth must be excluded from the dance of the stars. Notice we're a wallflower, we're not the lead. Or I will prove that the earth does have motion, that it surpasses the moon in brightness, and that it is not the sump where the universe, filth, and ephemera collect. Hmm. It's not the sump. Who is saying it is the sump? Well, everybody. In fact, if you wanted to go to the center of the earth, which is the real center, that's where hell was. So, in moving the earth into an orbit around the sun, we actually promoted the earth. So the Copernican principle is badly named. Furthermore, the Copernican principle can make ambiguous predictions. For example, should there be civilizations all over the galaxy? Or should civilizations be rare? Well, the first pass answer is that if we're not special, there should be others out there. But supposing that we're not special and we can't find evidence of others visiting here, then it raises the question of whether are, there are others. So are there others according to the Copernican principle or aren't there? You see, if we're not special and s some of those others should have been already advanced to beyond our civilization. I mean, after all, we're an average civilization. There are better ones. And they should have come here already. So if we don't find evidence for extraterrestrial activity, then what it means is that life actually must be pretty rare. So which is it? Do we predict life is very rare in the, in the cosmos, or do we predict it's very common? It's relatively rare. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the people on the first side, which the second side looks like it has more evidence for, start th saying things like, um, <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, maybe, uh, maybe they just haven't contacted us or something like that. And, Reminds me of Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes, the cartoon character, not the, uh, not the reformer who said, the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that it has not attempted to contact us. And if they've been watching our TV, I don't blame them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the third complaint about the Copernican principle is that it, is, it has in the past made poor predictions which raises the question of if you use it today, would you make the same kind of poor predictions? For example, other planets have life in the solar system. Well, they must because we're not special. And uh, now, the first thing I'll point out is that this is not exclusively the province of people who buy the Copernican principle in toto because Kepler believed in moon dwellers, that's what raised those circular things on the moon, which we now recognize as craters. Um, and um, perhaps more to the point is Percival Lowell who saw these canals on Mars. Well, now in the case of Kepler you can argue, but in the case of Lowell he explicitly used the Copernican principle that we are the sum and substance of the capabilities of the cosmos is something so pre preposterous as to be exquisitely comic. There's got to be something else out there. Man merely typifies in an imperfect way what he is going on elsewhere and what to a mathematical certainty is in some corners of the cosmos in, indefinitely, I, it may be infinitely excelled, I may have mistyped that. Um, so you see, we're just an average civilization. 
The sun is a fairly typical and ordinary star, and that's still maintained today. Problem is, the sun isn't a typical star. The sun is bigger than 91% of the stars out there. It's a big star. And it has a certain amount of what they call metallicity, that is to say, containing elements that are heavier than lithium. Those are metals. Even though lithium is technically a metal in the chemical sense, and beryllium is arguable, boron certainly arguable, and carbon is not usually considered a metal, and oxygen is definitely not considered a metal, in reference to um, astronomy, all of those are considered metals. Anything bigger than lithium is metal. Our solar system is typical. Well, as we are finding out, it's not really. In fact, the very first planet that was discovered, 51 Pegasi b, has a half the mass of Jupiter and orbits every 4.2 days, really close to its star. There are a lot of other planets that have been there, but uh, we're still hunting for one that has the size and, uh, um, and distance of Earth. But, well, maybe lots of planetary setups can have life on them. We've discovered a, a galactic, or not a galactic, but a uh, planet, a uh, I'm trying to think of what the correct, correct terms, uh, 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 habitable zone. And if you're not in a habitable zone, you're not habitable. It's that simple. And if you're too big, you're not habitable. And if you're too little, you're not habitable. And a whole bunch of things like that. Our solar system's location in the Milky Way is relatively unimportant. Turns out there is a galactic habitable zone. Our gal galaxy is not particularly exceptional or important. Some galaxies don't have a, galaxy, a galactic habitable zone. The universe is infinite in space and matter and eternal in time. And we're now realizing that at least as far as time goes, it's not eternal. And the known universe, the universe that we exist in, is not infinite in either space or matter. Very big, but not infinite. And the laws of physics are not specially arranged for the existence of complex or intelligent life. In Fred Hoyle, a vehement atheist for, until he got kind of pounded down and he still didn't like God, uh, the Christian God, um, noted that in fact our universe is specifically set up to create more carbon than it ought to under ordinary circumstances and to create less oxygen than it ought to and to create less neon than it ought to which is even more interesting in other words um, the uh, uh, the synthesis uh, process gets trapped partly at carbon and partly at oxygen and then doesn't go on to the rest of them until quite a bit later. Which means that carbon and oxygen are relatively common in the universe. Which means, of course, that water can exist and that carbon-based life has something to be based on. Now, the universe, in fact, it seems to be built for life. Some of those arguments depend on long age and are more convincing to Guillermo Gonzalez uh, 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 audience than they are to most certainly short age or short universe creationists. Uh, for example, the Earth requires plate tectonics. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but if you're a believer in long ages, uh, in the traditional sense, it certainly does. The universe requires carbon and water. God could have created an earth with plenty of 
carbon and plenty of water. But if you don't have God creating the earth, if you have God simply creating the universe and letting the earth happen however it happens, then you need a mechanism to have more carbon and water. There is, in the standard way of understanding things, a cosmic inhabitable age. Again, God could create stuff that would work. But in terms of uh, if you don't have God directly doing things, if you allow a, a standard scenario, there is only one age and we happen to live in it. The Earth's rotation needs stabilization by a large moon, otherwise it swings widely from near zero to around 60 degrees, uh, inclined to its orbit. 60 degrees would give you horrible weather, um, with some areas just simply not getting any sunlight at all for six months, and then other areas not getting it the next six months. Um, now, the now standard belief is that the moon was created by the collision of a Mars-sized body with the Earth. It had to be just the right angle. You think about that almost requires somebody to aim. But yet the moon is needed because you have to stabilize the Earth's rotation. There's a molten core. And then uh, there's an iron core beyond that, um, but the outer core of iron has to be molten because if it isn't, you can't keep generating the magnetic field that protects the Earth from cosmic rays. Now, of course, if you start out with a created Earth, this isn't necessarily an argument. But if you start out with an Earth that, that God didn't intervene in, then he had to make things work just the right way. Um, there, the Earth requires that magnetic field, and without the magnetic field, uh, we would uh, all die from cosmic ray exposure if we ever got off the ground in the first place. And yet, you have to keep that going, so you need a molten core. You need a circumstellar habitable zone, which means, by the way, uh, the molten core means you have to have an Earth big enough to have that molten core. Otherwise, if you like Mars, it's all kind of frozen in place. There's a circumstellar hab habitable zone. That's the one I, the name I was trying to remember. And we happen to be in it, just near the middle of it. You have to have an atmosphere that's good enough to shield you from cosmic rays, but it also has enough oxygen and enough carbon dioxide to keep animals and plants happy. The Earth has to be the right size. If it's too small, you lose the atmosphere, you lose that magnetic. If it's too big, you collect too big of an atmosphere and you have runaway greenhouse effect. The sun has to be the right size and it has to have the right amount of what they call metals again in order to clump planets around it. If you have a smaller sun, the problem is the Earth has to be so close to the sun that the gravitational tidal forces lock the Earth so that it does not uh, change faces as it orbits the sun, very much like the moon doesn't change faces as it orbits the Earth. It's gravitationally locked on Earth. Well, that would make a planet that, even though it was in the habitable zone, wouldn't be habitable because half of it would be baked all the time and the other half would be cold all the time. And then, of course, there's the galactic habitable zone, which turns out to be a very narrow area. It has to have enough metals in it, but it can't have too many cosmic rays or supernovae exploding next to it or things like that. And the galactic habitable zone happens to be where we are, which is between two spiral arms, about halfway out in the galaxy. You go too far out, you don't have enough metals to form planets. You go too far in, 
and uh, things get fried. But not only is the universe built for discovery, it's also built for, uh, pardon me, built for life, it's also built for discovery. Now some of this is correlated with build, being built for life. And they make the case that that's true. Um, if you have the moon of the size of ours that is stabilizing the Earth's spin, it gives total eclipses. Which, by the way, in all the planets that we have, it's almost totally unique to Earth. There is, I think Neptune has one moon that will eclipse the sun nearly, well, completely, uh, with very little left over so that from Neptune you could study the corona. But the moons of Jupiter are too big or too small. The moons of Mars are too small. The moons of Saturn are either too big or too small. So that you don't get this nice, neat fit of the moon over the sun where you can view the entire corona at one time. And the reason that's important for discovery is because of all kinds of things. You, we discovered the corona because we could look at the sun during a solar eclipse and see just the outside. Uh, Fraunhofer lines discovered by Fraunhofer uh, gave us a clue as to the kinds of material that was on the sun that allowed us to do solar spectra. Um, it proved that there was a layer of relatively cool gas, you know, thousands of degrees rather than millions of degrees, that's right next to the sun. And it allowed us to interpret stellar spectra, which meant that we could extend this to other stars, and which meant that we could determine the motion of stars, and we were able to determine the size and the age of the universe that way. All of that because we have total eclipses. Furthermore, we discovered the element helium on the sun because of its spectrum, well before we found it on Earth. In fact, helios is, of course, the Greek for sun. General relativity was most, uh, one of the more stringent tests was done when there was an eclipse and we could see how far starlight was bent around the sun. And then the sun enables us to time calendars of ancient people because we have total eclipses we can calculate back to when those were. And interestingly enough, total eclipses are not necessary if we wait another 250 million years or so, projecting into the future, the sun will creep outward from the Earth and we will not ever get total eclipses anymore. Even though the moon will probably still be somewhat stabilizing the Earth's rotation. And what that means is that the universe is built for discovery more than it actually has to be built for life. There is a clear atmosphere. Without that clear atmosphere, in the visible light range, we could not use telescopes to see stars. In fact, if we want to see stars in the ultraviolet or X-ray regions, we have to actually send a telescope out into orbit in order to see those wavelengths. We have the right uh, other planets for discovery. The smaller ones are closer to the sun, the larger ones are outside. And importantly, they are spaced in such a way that Kepler could discover that their orbits were elliptical which led to Newton's gravity, which led to Einstein. <coughs> Without those planets, we would not have discovered, probably would not have discovered gravity. Certainly if we did, it would be much, uh, 
a much smaller discovery and it would have taken a lot longer. Uh, we are able to use parallel x, that is to say you take the earth in one position, you take the earth in another position and you look up at a star and you see it change against the background of stars. So you can say stars are so far away. Uh, we can get up to about 300 light years with careful measurements. And um, if we were in a red dwarf, we would only have one tenth of the width, which would mean we would lose a lot of the stars. We would not be able to tell their parallax. There appears to be built into the universe a discovery ladder where we will learn one thing and then nature allows us to learn something more and then allows us to learn something more and we get our theories more and more refined as time goes on. We went from Kepler to Newton to Einstein, as mentioned above. Then there is the fact that the universe appears to be beautiful and that it appears to follow mathematical laws much better than one would expect. Well, at least if one didn't expect the universe to be the orderly product of an orderly creator. And then finally, what are all those galaxies out there doing? Well, maybe not much, but at the very minimum, they're allowing us to discover Hubble's law. which means they're allowing us to discover the, uh, the finitude of the universe. Now, he will go on to talk about the fact that we have ice cores and they allow us to look at the past and that we can look at foraminifera, little tiny sea creatures that make shells uh, that precipitate down and you can tell by which species predominates what the temperature is and so forth. And that these help us to look into the past. He talks about earthquakes that allows us to see what is inside the earth. Because for example, shear waves disappear at a certain distance about a third of the way around the earth. You don't have shear waves anymore which means that the inside core has to be uh, liquid. Uh, that enables us to understand that the Earth's structure is uh, what it is. And then there are magnetic reversals. Now, like I say, not all of these would be as convincing to a young Earth creationist. But the young earth creationists don't need to be convinced about the, uh, the fact that God designed the world for human habitation and designed it for beauty, designed it for discovery. But now we come to a darker side of the subject. There was opposition to the privileged planet hypothesis. In fact, uh, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, the lead author, who is a world expert in, in extraterrestrial or extra solar system planets, was denied tenure at Iowa State. Just before he was denied, about a year before or so, there was a petition circulating that protested intelligent design. Now, there is a loud claim that there was no relationship between uh, Gonzalez's denial of tenure and ID. Um, the petition didn't mention Gonzalez at all. Um, there, was, there is the claim that he had decreased academic output and that he wasn't pulling in enough grant money. Um, the grant money was not one of the uh, criteria, official criteria anyway, for, uh, for being promoted to tenure and in fact uh, Gonzalez did pull in some grant money. Some of it was from the Discovery Institute. Well, that grant money doesn't count. I guess, you know, it's tainted money or something. Um, and as far as decreased academic output, 
you can argue that he published less later on than he did earlier, but certainly he exceeded the output of all of his compatriots at the, uh, at the uh, physics and astronomy department. Um, but perhaps uh, most revealing is the fact that some emails have been obtained. Uh, and they're very interesting to read. Uh, Curtis Strzok wrote an email that said Guillermo has a book coming out in April on Earth's privileged place in the universe and intelligent design. Steve Kay is very upset about possible impacts. They're going to think we're all intelligent design people here, I guess. I'm rather sad that he wants to be so very public about something that I see as intellectually vacuous, though it may be spiritually satisfying. I think I'll talk to him about him at some point. Intellectually vacuous, well, we've been through some of this. It's not exactly intellectually vacuous. Why do they think that? And then Leanne Wilson replies to this email, I am aware of this and not exactly thrilled. I talked with him last year about perhaps waiting with the public bid until he gets past the tenure review, but I gather he feels strongly enough to be willing to take the risk. George Wallerstein calls him, quote, the best uh, postdoc I ever had, end quote, and it took me 24 hours to realize that the special look he gave along with that statement could be interpreted including present company. Who knows how this will go? At least it will get full daylight at the three-year review, not hit folks as a surprise at the final tenure decision. Actually, I think it is more than just vacuous. He's supporting a movement that is endangering science. What kind of science does intelligent design endanger? When Bruce Harmon chimed in, under medication, I decided to watch The Privileged Planet last night. Wow, ra really glossy professional filming with a nice British t accent to add authority. It saved the message until the last minute when the argument became all this neat stuff just could not happen by accident. There must be an intelligent designer. Now we can rejoice that there's meaning to everything. I suspect that is how primitive humans explain things and then rejoiced. It is a long way from science. Although the package is disguised to copy a Disney approach to dispensing science to the public. Gonzalez is right up front, nearly holding hands with the Discovery Institute guru, presumably meaning Richards. This one could approach a supernova during and particularly after the tenure meetings. I bet ISU even makes the international press how many days? Maybe we should help Eli, who is the department chairman, gird his loins before he loses them. Um, here's an announcement that was included in one of the emails. And uh, you'll notice that um, Gonzalez will review the leading ideas proposed by ID theorists and explain why they bl believe ideas are property, uh, properly a branch of science. He will end with a brief description of the evidence for design which he presented in his book, The Privileged Planet. And he gives time and date and so forth. And then there's a comment by Bruce Harmon. Gonzalez has given permission to tape the talk, so I guess we will see. I don't have any trouble voting for tenure based on his astronomy. I don't yet know the quality. But here he is claiming ID as a proper branch of science, and so I think he opens it up in his tenure consideration. It's not about intelligent design, it was about other things, remember? I would have thought, in a, in a, now here, this email seems to indicate that uh, I don't have trouble voting for tenure based on his astronomy. Knows he's a good astronomer, as far as I know. I don't know that much. I would have thought an intelligent person would have at least kept quiet until after tenure. Then you can advocate blowing up the moon. Interesting look at academia. There have been a number of potential, uh, Bruce Harmon again, there have been a number of potential candidates for a CMP and bio positions who have called asking about the climate in the department relative to ID. Who knows how many simply decided not to apply or inquire? And what about prospective graduate students? 
Now think about, let's supposing that this had been a Protestant university and Guillermo was a Catholic. And uh, they'd been calling up asking whether Catholics are uh, approved in our department and maybe if they aren't I'll go to another university because they uh, only approve of Protestants. How well would that sit? Make it black and white. Interesting. You see, he might embarrass our, our we, if, if free speech embarrasses us, then we can't have it. That's the implication. In response to Behe's testimony, colleagues at Lehigh, I think I, that's my typo, were quick with this statement in an attempt at damage control. I'm afraid we have not been quick enough to avoid damage, but I'm afraid further delay will lead to much more. If we have to take on the Discovery Institute, let's do it before we have an incoming class of ID students. The issue is not going away and it may get worse. A few of us over the weekend crafted a statement which we'd like you to see before we send it on to the higher administration and probably the local press. This is the petition that was signed, which by the way originated with an atheistic religion professor. Uh, uh, very interesting. Why, why would an atheist want to be teaching in a division of religion? Uh, I, I guess so as to show that it's a bunch of baloney. I think it is a big mistake for anyone in our department to go on record on this issue, given the upcoming next year up or out decision regarding our most vocal advocate for the use of ID to guide scientific inquiry. We will at that time, next fall, be taking on not only that faculty member, but advocates for his position with deep pockets and significant influence. You can see these guys are looking over their shoulder. Yes, it will get worse before it gets better, but circulating such a statement could accelerate the process and could easily play into the hands of your perceived advers adversaries. For example, it could be used to justify a legal claim of a hostile work environment that could be ammunition in any, any appeal for a tenure decision. Yeah. Damage has been done and more will happen. We need to minimize that damage. Pushing ahead with this statement will serve no purpose but to increase the damage, I feel. Simply put, next year, ten, you see he's assuming that the guy's going to lose and then he's going to sue on the basis of this. It's not that the guy's going to win. Because if the guy won, there wouldn't be a suit, right? You wouldn't have to look over your shoulder. Um, Next year's tenure review will be very closely scrutinized by the public and the press, and we must do whatever we can to make it a fair process. An unprecedented step such as a statement signed by members of the department doing the tenure review that the science being done by the candidate is no good works directly against our need to ensure an a fair review. I'm not sure exactly how that fits in. Um, I think this is, this is email and they don't you know, proofread necessarily. This one's not mine, by the way. If you think things are tough for us now, imagine what things will be like under those circumstances. I would be happy to talk with you and others about this. You'll probably find Eli feels even more strongly about this, but, I, but that he and I have different perspectives. And uh, this is Steve Kowaler, by the way. I fully understand your collective frustration over this and share it. Be he has tenure, so Bucknell's, that's obviously should be Lehigh's. Bio folks have freedom to express their opposition without worry. Isn't tenure a wonderful thing? So we can't say anything because if we say something, people will think that we're biased when we vote him down. Um, <clears throat> Another email from Bruce Harmon. I don't see how waiting until a year from now for a tenure decision is going to make things easier. Do we, hope, uh, do we do everything at secret meetings and then hope the Discovery Institute's lawyers don't subpoena our records? Which, by the way, this is um, subpoena. That's why it's out there now. <laughs> if I were Gonzalez, I would prefer my colleagues were honest and forthright in their opinions as he seems to be with his. Anyway, I've not talked with Eli or had a response from him yet. 
I will test a few more waters. It will help to have as many signatures as possible. This is collecting this protest signature. We need to just be up front and say, yep, that, this is the way we feel. And uh, Marshall Luban, I believe that it is time for the department to take a stand. However, I think that it would be the best to limit public statements pertaining to our department and ID rather than a jump to endorse a host of organizational proclamations of a broad nature. Unless people very carefully go through and carefully consider the details of these grandiose proclamations and then debate in the department. Whether we as a department need to be so specific that ID is not science. See, we're definitely believing that ID is not science. Instead, I would suggest that our department go officially on record with a very simple and clear declaration such as, notice how bland this is. We do not offer, nor will we offer, any course on ID, nor will we sponsor or advocate any lecture or debate or public forum on the subject of ID. We're just not going to talk about it. We're not going to say it's good. We're not going to say it's bad. Just, just zip. Mm. Any simple idea can be turned around by a shrewd enough lawyer. In my opinion, the best publicity ISU can dream about is a direct and open confrontation with the Discovery Institute and the like, even in the worst situation of the court turning against the department. On the other hand, they're anticipating getting rid of this guy, having a lawsuit, and being stuck with, they got to keep him anyway. On the other hand, our open statement signed and put in a visible place will show to Gigi that this is not a friendly place for him to develop, develop, further develop his ideas. He may look for a better place as a result. If we make it hostile enough, maybe he'll leave. Isn't that kind of the definition of creating a hostile environment? Um, also, I agree with Bruce. It is not nice to discuss all this behind his back. All these emails that are going back and forth, we, nobody's cluing him in. After all, he is probably honestly believes what he, in what he is doing, and he's certainly a courageous man. An open statement will clear up the air. So we need to put that statement out. This is interesting, Bruce Harmon again. He has crossed the line in a few places where he's admitted that he uses ID to do science. That is crossing the line. I think it's sincere, so perhaps he would not mind talking and discussing it so they could learn where the faculty stood. But nobody's going to talk to him. We're just keeping it. We should expect that the DI, or whoever comes to Guillermo's age, will be subpoenaing our records and anything else they can get, including copies of the emails that are being exchanged between all of us. In other words, these things. So with that in mind, keeping this process as fair as possible should be utmost. Wait a minute. Yeah. Before doing anything further on this, you should get some sort of advice from Tanaka's office. That's the lawyer. See my previous note, which reflected discussions I have already had with the former employment lawyer that I sleep with each night. He happens to be married to her. In other words, you're in shaky ground. You really, you could be sued. You could get the pants sued off of you. Uh, another comment, I had a discussion yesterday evening with my son Paul, who has had a management training in Sandia. I told him about the current situation and the concerns about hostile work environments. His opinion was that indeed lawyers might well be successful in convincing a jury of average Americans that publication of our statement was responsible for creating a hostile work environment. They know what they're doing is wrong, is illegal. Maybe it's not wrong, depending on how you view things. He even thought about that if Eli got a written opinion from the university attorney, this might be offered as further evidence of collusion to create a hospital work environment. Paul thought that the farthest he would go is to have Eli ask the university attorney off the record so it can't be discovered for what courts have considered as hostile work environments. You might want to investigate this before we go further. 
As strong as my feelings are on this matter, I have come around to Steve Caller's point of view. I now feel the publication of such a statement might be the most important piece of evidence in a successful court case to guarantee tenure to the person whose scientific credibility we would be attempting to discredit. I fear that a published statement from a group of scientists closely connected to the department might put the whole situation in jeopardy. I therefore wish to withdraw my name from any public statement from a group of scientists closely connected to the department. So he's not going to sign it. That's John Clem. Um, and now we come to what I think is the piece de resistance. Eli Rosenberg, this is the chair's statement in Guillermo Gonzalez's tenure dossier. They have to keep records of why they fired and didn't fire. On numerous occasions, Dr. Gonzalez has stated that intelligent design is a scientific theory and someday would be taught in science classrooms. This is confirmed by his numerous postings on the Discovery Institute website. The problem here is that intelligent design is not a scientific theory. Its premise is beyond the realm of science. Now, having said that, he goes on to say, but it is incumbent on a science educator to clearly understand and be able to articulate what science is and what it is not. The fact that Dr. Gonzalez does not understand what constitutes both science and a scientific theory disqualifies him from serving as a science educator. He was not given tenure because of his belief in intelligent design. There is really no question. Of interest, they had nine people from outside ISU review his uh, tenure. And of the nine review letters, uh, six strongly supported his tenure promotion and gave glowing endorsements of his reputation and academic achievements. Even Dr. Gonzalez's tenure dossier admitted that five of the external letter writers, including senior scientists at prestigious institutions, recommended his promotion, and only three did not. And here's one of those recommendations. Dr. Gonzalez is eminently qualified for the promotion according to your guidelines of excellence and scholarship and exhibiting a potential for national distinction. In the light of your criteria, I would certainly recommend this promotion. They got six in favor, three against, the department voted against. Can anybody rationally say that it wasn't about intelligent design? Now, my take on this whole thing is the earth is obviously set up for life. But that's not a big deal because if the earth wasn't set up for life, we wouldn't be here because we'd be dead. The weak anthropic principle virtually guarantees that the earth is set up for life. However, we are finding out that this setup is rare in our galaxy and, in fact, rare in most galaxies. The Earth is also set up for discovery, which is perhaps even more interesting. Gonzalez and Richards believe that the two are related, and that's probably partly true. But I don't think it's completely true, and where they don't overlap, I think, is an even stronger argument. You see, um, for example, we don't really need a clear atmosphere in order to survive well. We could have some kind of high cl haze cloud cover uh, that keeps the Earth at an even temperature, for example. There are people who believe that anti the antediluvians didn't have quite as clear a sky as we do now. So there's no particular reason to, to say that the Earth has to have a clear atmosphere in order to be habitable. And the same thing is true of the total eclipse. The, Earth could, the moon could be a little further away or a little smaller or both, and we'd only have annular eclipses. Or it could be a little bigger or a little closer in, or both. Uh, and we would have then uh, total eclipses, but eclipses that were so massive that you could not see the corona all the way around the moon. And so you don't really have to have the, um, the total eclipses or the clear atmosphere, either one, in order to have a habitable Earth. And the weak anthropic principle has virtually nothing to say about this. 
The Earth was designed for discovery not only as a part of its being designed for habitability, but in addition. Now, so I see this as an actually a very powerful argument for intelligent design. Gonzalo's public beliefs had a great deal to do with his not receiving tenure at ISU, probably the majority. And you have to ask yourself why. Because as I'll point out, Gonzalez did not challenge evolution or even Darwinian evolution. Evolution with no input from God whatsoever. You can fit that into his theory easily. Gonzalez did not challenge a naturalistic origin for life. In fact, he almost assumed it. So if it's not about, it's not about evolution, it's not about the origin of life. All this stuff you hear about how it's all about evolution versus intelligent design is a bunch of bunkum. Evolution has to be, happens to be one point in the major controversy and not the most important one. The important one as far as I can see is that science, in their view, has to be made safe for atheism. You see, what he's challenging is that this is all random stuff and the universe wasn't made for us. That's what he's challenging. Purpose simply cannot be allowed in the universe. And that was the sin of Guillermo Gonzalez. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. It okay. seems to me that uh, that one of the major concerns you you really addressed the point uh, at, in your conclusion uh, that um, science has to be safe for atheism. Um, I think the problem is that if atheism loses science, it basically has lost the very foundation for its existence. Um, it, it has nothing to recommend itself by. There Currently, are no holy books to fall back on. That's right. There is nothing to stand on. Currently, atheism has, in some sense, hijacked science and using it as its promotional vehicle, even though it never invented science. The irony of it is that by fighting this kind of a fight, it seems to me that they're undermining the very, mm, the very reasons for having science in the first place. Why would you explore things why would you even care if nothing mattered, if there is no purpose, if all purpose has to be eliminated from thought? All such, you know, it, it seems to be a self-defeating approach, in my thinking at least. It's an interesting question. Um, if it is so self-defeating, why do they keep studying it anyway? The um, Fermi's paradoxes, you know, Enrique Fermi, probably back in the 40s, 50s, something like this, was, um, yeah, I think, a lunch meeting or just with friends, and they're going into, oh, there must be 
millions and billions and trillions of planets out there, you know, on average, there's going to be millions, you know, like us in the galaxy. And uh, Enrico Fermi simply said, well, you know, if there's supposed to be that many intelligent civilizations, where are they? You know, why, why aren't they here? Why don't they visit us? You know. Yeah, and some of us should be more. Some of them should be more advanced than we are, and therefore, they should have had the technology to get here. Well, uh, and that's that's my point here, and that is not only advanced, but by by standard understanding, it would be at least a hundred thousand years older than us, probably millions or even billions, um, and. Uh, it seems, I think, reasonable that with enough time, with technolo technologic advancement, that we would be able to send probes to all part of the, of the galaxy at close to the speed of light, so 100,000 years. I mean, it, 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 there, there's a real big problem, as I see it, in terms of the idea that evolution is happening out there and, you know, it, it progresses on a path that they think that, that we've come, um, in that there's really, from a from an standpoint of intelligence, uh, in the galaxy, there's really like it, it seems as though they'd have to logically conclude that there's basically zero, really zero that survived. Um, in which case, if there's really zero in the galaxy, then I think it'd be, beg the question: Well, then is there really maybe zero in the universe? In other words, if it's if it's so difficult, you know, with with this much, perhaps it's really not possible. In which case, it brings us back to the question: Is what are we doing here? You know. Um, in, in the back to the multiverse, you know, to, to try to escape that, you know, that, that sort of thing. So it, it strikes me as though this, this whole thing is just begging for, you know, hey, there, you know, there is a reason why we're here. There was a, you know, fiat uh, creation. Uh, and um, uh, it seems to me as though from that standpoint, the, the, the evidence is fairly lacking that, you know, evolution is a process that, that occurs anywhere frankly. Um, but my, uh, another point or question that I have in that is, um, well, a couple ones. Number one is if you are on a planet with uh, a moon, you know, larger in, in apparent size than, than our moon, so that you don't get the ring all the way around, but you only get a portion, would you still see the atmosphere? Would you still discover helium with a, a portion of the atmosphere visible? Possibly you would, but it would be a lot harder. I mean, you still get the spectra. You still take a photograph of the, of the spectra, so it seems like you should be able to see it. Yeah, I, I don't think it would stop. You know, if you had, still, you had a clear atmosphere so you, and, and, you had, and you had the moon that, let's say, would cover twice the area of the sun, you'd get a little tiny sliver of the, of the uh, corona. So you get, you get something. It wouldn't be, you would be completely lacking. Also, if our atmosphere was, uh, you couldn't see through it, um, then could you see through it with radio telescopes? And if so, could there be discovery of star, the moon, stars, etc.? In other words, would, our, would the discovery simply be delayed rather than not possible? If we were to understand the principles of gravity, see with, with radar that the moon is there, and figure out with physics that we can travel these places. We can launch suborbital or, or orbital yeah. to get out of the atmosphere, and hence, the, you know, we discover the yeah. universe at that time. Well, I think we would still have day and night because I think that you'd still have enough sunlight filtering into where you could say, yeah, it's brighter now and yeah, it's darker now. Um, you might or might not be able to see the sun as a kind of vaguely distinct disk. Uh, you might or might not be able to see the moon in the same way as a vaguely distinct di disk. And part of the reason I'm bringing this up is because there are people who've hypothesized with uh, reasonable arguments that, in fact, the uh, antediluvian sun and moon were exactly that way. And one of the functions of the, this cloud cover was to reflect enough heat back so that you were comfortable during the day and you could be comfortable during the night without having to wear clothes. Um, but it's, a, it's um, if that happens, 
you would probably be able to tell the sun and the moon, and that would be about it. Maybe if you're lucky with one or two of the brightest stars. That's what I saw last night. Uh, yes, um, there are people in Southern California who think that's the way it always is. Ago, <laughs> <laughs> we were in Arizona in a dark area, and you could look up and see the Milky Way and all the stars. It was fantastic. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that that's, uh, uh, it, it, we went up to Sequoia National Park, which is, of course, at a fairly high elevation and away from most of the cities. And, you know, you go up there and you just look up and you go, wow. Yes. You kind of wonder, where was this all this other time? Well, I if you're born in the Midwest, you know it was. <laughs> <laughs> or if you grew up in the Midwest, I should say. Yes. Two things. One is, what in the world were those people thinking when they wrote those emails? I always told my faculty, if you don't want to see it in court, don't put it in an email. I, I'm just puzzled that they would put that much detail in an email. And the second thing is, what happened to Guillermo Gonzalez? Well, as I understand it, he decided not to fight. I think he felt that it was hostile enough work environment that he didn't want to work there. Uh, he wound up going to City College, I think it was in New York, and then moved on to Ball State University, which is in Indiana, uh, which by itself is an interesting thing. Uh, he is now at a university that had, for a while, a course on you know, science philosophy issues which included intelligent design by a teacher who was reportedly friendly to that possibility. Uh, and uh, the local atheist association got hold of it. Uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation or something like that, which is an, a bit of an ironic name itself, they shut down the course. They got the administration to say that we can't have this course here. Uh, of interest, there's another course on campus that used a textbook with a diametrically opposed result, or a diametrically opposed philosophy. And um, that course was not shut down at the same time. So there's some real questions as to whose side the administration is on, although I don't, frankly, I don't think it's so much that administration's on that side as I think the administration is, a, is more afraid from lawsuits from that side, is what it boils down to. But he's still there. So, which, which university is he at? Uh, he's at uh, Ball State University. Which is? Uh, university of Indiana, if I remember correctly. And he's still doing work. Yes. I'm a little confused after last week's presentation. The Big Bang sent all the matter of the universe scattering out, and the theory is the universe is expanding. One of the points for a friendly Earth is a static distance of the Earth from the sun. And the young man asked, if the universe was expanding, how come we are not drifting away further from the sun. And um, I don't remember what the answer was, but I'd like to hear it again. Uh, the reason you don't remember what the answer was is because I didn't give one. And the reason I didn't give one is because I don't have a good one, I don't know of a good one, and I think this is one of the weaknesses of that particular theory. Um, Isn't there a slow drift? But Supposedly, the gravitational fights against this expansion enough to where this, the Earth doesn't gradually drift out from the sun. So only galaxies are expanding from each other. That's a problem. Yes? One of my doctoral students who's from China said that recently scientists in China published a paper, in Chinese of course, so I can't read it, saying that there is no expansion of the universe, that the Big Bang Theory is in trouble, and that we're not expanding. 
Um, I, unfortunately, I can't comment on that much. I haven't seen the article, let alone the arguments behind it. And let's face it, in science, what people say doesn't matter. What does matter is what is the evidence and what are the logical arguments from that ev evidence. Uh, just a minute, let me, let me catch that comment. Go ahead. I, I was just adding a third thing to what you said, and is it, what, what does it matter to science, and is it safe for atheists also? Well, there are some people who believe that really the business of science is getting grant money and, give, and making publications. I think that's a terribly cynical and venal reason for doing science. It's how you get tenure. Um, yeah. Uh, but, y you know, if that's, your, if that's your answer, then of course you go the coward's way, I think. Uh, Gonzalez certainly didn't go the coward's way, and he paid for it. And I think you'll see a lot of people who are design friendly keep their mouth shut until they get tenure. And then the question is, do you open it then? Well, yeah, you're afraid of the granting bodies then. So you never, you never say anything. The whole point is it's you're intimidated. You're, you're perpetually gagged, essentially. Yeah. Well, to be fair, Michael Behe, who has tenure at Lehigh, yeah. is not gagged well, and makes the most of it. But he doesn't have grant money, so yeah, there you, there you go. So get your research done quick, and then, then come out with your true beliefs. Uh, somehow that doesn't seem to be, to be, to me, to be the open kind of inquiry that science is famous for. Anyway, come back next week and we'll talk about the origin of life. And, uh, in the meantime, uh, if you have the chance, uh, the book signature in the cell is probably the best resource I know of to get all of that information in one place. I had a, I had a question uh, about the, uh, the size of the, of the planets, you know, that is uh, inhabitable. I could see, like, say, at least for bacteria, just, you know, curious, you made me curious, uh, like, if it, now, smaller would probably not be as much of a problem as bigger, I'm assuming. But like with bacteria, uh, what kind of uh, pressures could bacteria live under, in other words? From well, some of them live quite a ways under the earth, so I'm sure that they, what they can tolerate probably, is, yeah. is one thing. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is that, that some of those requirements are more for intelligent life than they are for... Yeah, uh, life itself. Yeah. But it's interesting that on you know, Mars so far we haven't discovered life, period, let alone intelligent life. Well, here's part of the problem with space travel too, right? Is if you're in a gravity, uh, no gravity environment, and your, 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 your bones lose, uh, you know, it's uh, calcium or, or strength and your muscle mass and goes deplete, gets depleted. <laughs> You know, you're going to be like a string. By the time you land on the new planet, you can't stand up. Yeah, you're like a jellyfish. <laughs> so I don't know how they get past that.